officially live on Facebook for the Thursday edition of the Not Your Average Investor Show. The Junior WB Red Solid Garbage of the Week. Week, 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 week. I'm your host, Pablo Gonzalez. With me, as always, the man that I affectionately call GC because he's got the genius concepts, knows how to generate cash flows. He's a great co-host. And because his name is Greg Cohen, say hello, Greg. Hello, everybody. Great to be with you. Where this is always, managing the chat, being as helpful as she can be, magnificently, Madison, the magnificent, our community manager, say hello, Madison. Hello, everybody. And our guest investor today, a man who has been through 20 plus years of an investing odyssey to join us here today from the from the East Coast, currently residing in Milipitas, California, which well is not the right way to pronounce it. He is a patent attorney, right? Patent attorney? That's right. Got That's it. Right. Louis Hudnell, man. Regular on the show. We all know your name, man. It's great to see your face. Welcome to the show. Likewise. Thank you. Good to be here. It's good to good to have you, man. Good to good to have you on board. It's good to have our community dialing in. If you are, listen, oh, <laughs> of course, we also got the JWB team in the house. Yeah. JWB team. This is awesome. We're doing this uh, experiment, I guess, yeah. like, uh, about once a month. Sure. <laughs> maybe, Why not? Maybe not next month, but uh, we're innovating. We're innovating. We're, we're innovating. We're checking it out. We're bringing in the community. The community <laughs> is not just us and and our and our not your average investor community the team that is the secret to success here at jwb bringing them on board if you're watching on youtube if you're watching on facebook if you are listening on the podcast we love having you on board you know what i would suggest greg what would you suggest pablo i, I would suggest going to n y a i s dot com register join us it's a good time you may get a nickname if you add enough value here i will probably mispronounce your name but you will definitely get <laughs> called out for the roll call you ready for the roll call Dulles? i sure am let's go all right madison says welcome to the not your average investor show drew barnhill the ringmaster of the not your average investor show community says good afternoon everybody we got john henning good afternoon all we got dean curry good afternoon from columbus ohio we got leo faraganan dun, dun, na, na, na. faraganan dun, 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 dun. say good morning from all from sunny bay area another rockin show awaits noah rondari is in the house tbd on the nickname God, how do we not have a nickname I, I need to bring to task the nickname department of the show I, I, by the way i think that this dialogue is his nickname this is what makes him famous all right we got Peter James from the esteemed Commonwealth of, of Virginia. He says, top of the afternoon to you, Greg. Oh, that's very good. I like that. We got Matthew Clark saying hello from Tampa. Matthew Clark, new name? Have you been Might, be a new name. Might be a new name. Might be a, is that a new name alert? Two first names, two last names. I like it. Oh, you, you definitely know you can trust him now. <laughs> yeah, I, I can trust that guy. We got Tony Dopazo. That's definitely a new name saying hello from Brooklyn. Tony, welcome All to the right. show. Man. That's one of my friends there. He's he's gonna if like if you put some weird questions in the in the chat box, it's coming from him. <laughs> <laughs> give, us, give us the juice, Tony. I want to hear it. We got Lee Bishop, the MVP of the Not Average Investor Show community, saying great afternoon to everyone. So glad to see the team. We got Marilyn Cotterman. She says, hi, family, from home of of Florida. Home of the manatees. Home of the manatees. Lewis, you ever swam with manatees before? Never. Majestic. I, I don't even know what it is. I know you say it all the time, but I'm like, what is a manatee? <laughs> it's the sea cow, man. It's, uh, <laughs> very famous here in Florida. We got Ken and Carolyn Maline, the matriarch and patriarch of the first family of the Nacho <laughs> Professor Show. Do we, we tip the cap to the first I family? I salute them. You I salute them. them. So what do you do you to Peter James? Cap. You tip the cap to Peter James. Uh, we tip the cap to Peter James yeah. and we salute yeah. the first family. Catch up, buddy. Well, All right. welcome back. Well. <laughs> Here we go. What else? what else we got? He says, uh, good news. Ken says, good news. They're finally closing on 644 Hernan Street, home number eight for the Malays. All right. Let's go. Virtual high Virtual five for high you guys. Five. Love that. We got Jen Filzen, the fairy godmother of the Not Your Average Investor Show community. She says, good morning, JWB family. Greetings from Worley, Ohio by Cor Delen. Ooh. I don't even know what that means, but it sounds fancy and I like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got Aaron O'Neill. Aaron says All hello, right. Pablo and Greg. Aaron, I missed you last week. On Tuesday, I took... At the Super D Duper meetup, I yes. said that I was going to say your name until you're sick of it because I never say your name. Yes. But I need your help checking in now that you're in. You're in, Aaron. Great to have you on board. It was great meeting you at the Super D Duper meetup. And we also got Bill Shields is flipping it on us with a Guten Nemistag Freunds. I like how he's putting you to task I, today, buddy. I, I, I'm not the biggest. I'm more comfortable with the Espanol, <laughs> but I'm with you, Fraulein. Whatever, whatever that is. Guten Tag. We got Gerard Wendling. He's back. Welcome back, Gerard. He says, hello, JWB and Louis. 
We got Renee Deombre saying hello, everybody. That's a new name. Wonderful. Wonderful. Renee, Renee's a client, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. right. Deombre Renee's, means Renee a client. Man. Renee's a client. All right. Wonderful, yeah. Renee. So happy to have you here. All right. All right. Good to have you on board. We got Michael Santoris. He says, good morning, JWB from Northern Virginia. Welcome back. Michael, I don't think I missed anybody. Man, this was a... The roll call keeps getting bigger and better every time. Lewis, you're pulling great people, man. Hey. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. And now for our favorite segment, Madison Shares Good News. Hello, everybody. So this week is my favorite news to share. As you can probably guess it, JWB Cares. This one was a little shocking, but in the best way possible. So... In the last three weeks, JWB Cares new clients and old clients have donated eight hundred dollars by putting new homes under contract. That number goes up. Yes, that might be a new record for the last few weeks. Normally, I mean, I won't say even normally. We've had this huge uptick between like four and six. Been been four to six. Yeah. Do you want to give Ashley and Brian a shout out? They are current clients. They put four hundred dollars towards. JWB cares when they put. That's out. incredible. That's incredible. Let's go. What a community. What a community we have, right? That's Investing in rental properties is one thing, but then thinking about going the extra mile and donating $400 to the mission of JWB cares is just a testament to the type of people we get to surround ourselves with. So mm-hmm. thank you, everybody. I love it. And I love, the, I love the live audience participation. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> I, this is awesome. Awesome. All right, GC. You don't really have breaking news today, but we do have an update, a little teaser. We got some questions that have rolled in that we owe you an answer on. We're either going to get to them at the end of today during the Q&A segment, mm-hmm. or we're going to do it on Tuesday, right? We're yep. going to TBD for right Michael now. Michael Santorios, Mike Foster, the answers <clears throat> are coming. Thank you, everybody, for sending questions in either on the chat here or over email. We get them all. We're going to make sure that we have this platform to answer them for, for you all. So thank you all. All right. And now to the star of the show. Lewis, tell us about your, your kind of, what is, what is your investing kind of holdings these days? Right now I'm just doing buy and holds. So I've got two JWB properties. I just closed on the second one a couple of weeks ago and looking to, you know, just keep stacking, just keep stacking them and stacking them. Congratulations, man. That's incredible. So I think it would be really wonderful to hear about the journey that you had. And you know what? We were talking a little bit off camera right before the show. And your thoughts of the opportunity in real estate, it seems have, have changed as you have learned more. It sounds like originally buy and flip was something that you were really focused on. And maybe that was the intriguing thing right off the bat. And now it's all buy and hold. Can you tell people about that journey? Sure. I think I'm not sure where to start. Cause, uh, you know, like, like Pablo said, I've been doing this, been doing real estate for probably 20, over 20 years. And so I think I've had a couple of different cycles, but so I don't want to be too long winded, but you know, most recently I would say since I joined, you know, fortune builders in 2017, you know, we started off my wife and I actually our partner, uh, Tony, who's on, who's on, we started off doing rehabs and we did two rehabs here in, in San Jose, California. And we were kind of kind of caught up in that energy, like, you know, seeing these, you know, you know, big numbers in terms of flip values, you know, flip spreads. But, you know, what we found out was, you know, well, first the market kind of shifted on us. We got, got in a little bit late, I think from a market perspective that impacts the ARV, you know? And so when you go to sell, you know, if you're not getting the same ARV that you projected when you started eight months ago, you know, it's going to, you know, you're not going to see the profit that you were, you were, you know, predicting to get. Absolutely. And so. You know, going through that process and all the work that was involved in me, it was like a lot more work than, than I thought it was going to be. I was just like, I I just can't do this. Like, this is just too much work. I need to find, and I need to find a way to play real estate that fits, you know, my life. And as Pablo mentioned, I'm a full-time attorney, so I'm really busy, you know, during the day. And so I just kind of, you know, my, my, my mindset sort of shifted. I went to the April, 2018 rental boot camp with fortune builders. And it just totally, you know, flipped my mind around about passive investing. I mean, I mean, I knew about passive investing at the time, but I didn't really think about it in the way that fortune builders sort of, you know, taught me to think about it. And it was kind of from that, that was kind of just a pivot point right there. And since that point, I've been, you know, we've been completely focused on passive and we finished up our rehabs in 2019, but then just moved forward with focusing on passive. 
you know, there were a couple of talking points that I thought were really critical. And I know that others who are listening here on the show right now can relate to. And I remember you telling me there was this shift in your mind when you went to that training of like, wow, I don't only need to invest in my backyard, right? I can be strategic and find that right market and I can find that right team. Can you talk to people about that transition? Because that's huge. When, you've, when you believe that that's a strategy and whole world opens up and this becomes a lot more scalable. So can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I can kind of go into that boot camp. I always had the I always had the mindset invest in what you know. And so at that point, you know, 2018, I'd already been investing in real estate for about 15 years and I only invested in cities that I actually knew. So, I I had lived in San Francisco for a while. I, I had bought some properties there. I went to law school in in Philadelphia. I bought some properties there and then I uh I grew up in Buffalo, New York and I bought some properties there. So I had only invested in, in places that I knew, but then at this boot camp, you know, they this, they threw out this concept. Okay, you know, live on the coast, which I do. I've lived on the east coast. I live, live on the west coast. Never lived in the middle of the country, but live on the east coast. Live on the coast. Buy in the middle of the country. And I said, hmm, that's kind of interesting. I never really thought about it like that. And you know, I remember Paul Shively. You know, he put. You know, you've had Paul Shively on the show. Absolutely, good friend. You know, he threw up his portfolio during this boot camp, and I saw like, you know, Indianapolis, Kansas City, Memphis, Jacksonville. I was like, and you know, all these places that I don't think I've been to any of those places. And I was like, wow, this is just a completely different, you know, he lives in San Diego and he's invested in all these places. Why well, live in, you know, San Jose, Milpitas? I can do the same thing. Right. And so, um, so yeah, it just totally, you know, shifted my mindset that like I don't actually need to be there. And so, so, you know, when I, when we left the rental boot camp, you know, immediately set up a call with the passive income club to talk about the different markets. And I said, I told them I want high appreciation, no snow, right? High appreciation, <laughs> no snow. I want Sunbelt. If I have to go to this property, that's somewhere where I don't know, I don't want to see any snow in the ground. That's and awesome. so, um, and I think also throughout there under 200 K right under 200 K mm -hmm. purchase price. And so, you know, they said, you want Jacksonville? I said, okay, we're going to Jacksonville. And that was, <laughs> that's kind of was the start of, of getting focused on, you know, investing in Jacksonville and they put us in touch with JWB, you know, et cetera. And uh, I think this is one of the coolest stories involving, right? You doing your due diligence, but also this platform that we have now with the show, because what Lewis was sharing with us is that, you know, investing in what you know may not mean, you know, being from that city, but he st still did his due diligence. And what he did is he gave himself a commitment and he said, I'm not going to invest until I have watched three months of the Not Your Average Investor show. And especially on the Thursday shows where we break down the properties of the week. And that was his due diligence. That was a big part of his, his due diligence. So how cool of a story is that? I mean, when he told us that earlier, I was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're doing something right. Yeah, we're doing something right, man. That's awesome, Lewis. Great, great feedback on that one. You're, you're, ready to, you're ready to do some due diligence? Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it, man. Let's magically whisk ourselves away here to... 10, 4, 3, 7, 104. God, that's a tough one. <laughs> 104, 37, Tulsa Road, Jacksonville, Florida, 32218. It's got a purchase price of $230,000. Still no snow, but it's a four bed, two bathroom house with, what do we got here? A lease of 1564 and a estimated conventional financing total ROI of 11 point two six percent lewis we're gonna go to you in a second but first gc what do you like about this property thought you'd never ask well we the first thing that i like about this property is of course that it is available right it is available and availability right now is key in a market where you have severe limitations on the supply side but you guys probably expected me to say that right i say that pretty much every single week i wanted to focus on one thing that i don't think we have drilled down enough into and these are opportunities that don't come around all that often, but when they do, they set an investor up for success so well coming out of the gates. And it's when we have a buyer credit, right? When I say buyer credit, what I mean is that the investor that purchases this home literally leaves the closing table with a check, right? We talk about when we buy properties, right? We have to bring money to the, to the table. 
right? We have to pay for closing costs. We have to pay all this stuff. Well, how nice would it be to actually leave the closing with a check as well? And what happens for a property like this one here on Tulsa is that the buyer, the client who owns this property actually is walking away with a $6,960 check at closing. Now, what this does, of course, is it sets you up for success. If we're here to determine a, and earn a return on investment, there's nothing better I can do for you to set up yourself for success on beating that return on investment expectation than literally starting out with a $6,960 head start. And then the other question, many of you who maybe if you're just new to the show, you might be asking, well, why does this make sense for JWB to do this? What this is, is JWB looking at this opportunity and trying to create a win-win-win. Trying to create a win for the investor who owns this property. And the win there, of course, is what I just described, right? Setting that investor up for success, right? That buyer credit for them is obviously something that's going to put them in the driver's seat. The next win that we're talking about is the resident, okay? So what happens from time to time is JWB acquires properties that already has a resident in place. Now, that resident might have a lease in place that is less than market rent. And so we have to abide by that lease. What we do is we come up with a solution where we can, of course, win for the client, but also win for the resident. And what we do here is JWB supplements the difference between that rent that the resident is paying versus what market rent is today. And what this does is, number one, we have to do this to, to honor the lease that that resident has. But what it does is it creates an asset now that JWB can sell. And of course, that's the third win there. JWB gets to win because we have inventory now when a lot of our comp competitors out there are really struggling. So this buyer credit makes sense as a win for everybody. But for you as a client who's buying the property, this is so rare. It's just so rare. Normally when you buy a property, right, you have cash flows that start coming in and they start stacking up over months and months and months. You don't typically walk in with a windfall like this. So this home is a great example of setting this client up for success who owns it. And uh, that's what I love most about this property. Well, there you go, buddy. So, so three things, one, it's available Two, buy your credit three. It's got a bunch of upside on the rent side. Well, absolutely. We can talk through about that as well. Should I, I mean, I feel like I was just on my soapbox. You want me to go there? No, too? no, you're good. You're good. You're good. <laughs> I think we should, uh, <laughs> well, don't, sure, don't tempt me. I'm sure we're going to get right back into that. I, you know, it's funny, man. As you were telling me about the buyer credit, I think of that scene in like Goodwill Hunting where he's at a job interview that he's not really interested in. And mm -hmm. he's just like, you know, I can just, if I walk out of here with a hundred bucks in my pocket, I, I think, I think that would really sway me. And it's like his friend is Ben Affleck that's there. Yeah. So I, I feel like that buyer credit is just like, you're walking out with some cash in your pocket. Love it. I don't remember the scene, but I'm just going to nod. Like, you, I'm, I'm totally Matt done. Damon. You're Ben Affleck. No big deal. <laughs> All right. Lewis, I've been, I've been looking forward to hear your response because you gave us a little teaser about when we, you know, we traditionally ask the guest investor, you know, where does your head go when you look at this thing? So you said you have a little bit of a different take on it. What's your take, man? Where does, where does your eye go right now? So I'll, I'll just cut right to the chase. The, the very first number that my eye goes to when I look at any of these spreadsheets is the zip code. Oh. I look at the zip code and the reason I do that is because, because like I said, I think I said before, I've never been to Jacksonville. So I, I don't even, I don't know anything about, it. I mean, I don't, I mean, I know a lot now, but I don't never been there. Can't feel it, you know, haven't seen it. And so like Greg was saying, when I, when I spent this, this three month period, you know, sort of doing my due diligence, I wanted to, I wanted to see a hundred properties. Like I wanted to get to the point where I had a, I had evaluated a hundred properties before I even made a purchase. And so in doing that, I needed a way to sort of organize in my head, you know, okay, where, where, where are these places? Like what's, you know, just, just generally, generally speaking, you know, relative to each other. I know you, you speak about the North side and the West side. And I think there's one other neighborhood. I forget the mm -hmm. name of it. South but, side Arlington. So, okay. There you go. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean anything to me because I don't live there, right? Like, right. like I want to know where three two two one eight is. I want to know where you know my properties are three two two. I think it's four four three two two zero oh, six. Like, I want to. I look at that zip. I look. I pull up the Jacksonville zip code map all the time, mm -hmm. and I'm looking to figure out where these properties are. And so, so that's the first thing I do. And then what I do after that, and this is kind of quirky to me. You know, I don't know if other people do this. Like, again, I haven't even looked at the purchase price yet. I know a lot of people focus on the purchase price, but I, I do this second step, which is I'll punch in that zip code into Zillow home values. Mm -hmm. 
and I want to know the average home price or the median home price in that zip code, mm -hmm. right? Because then that'll then then I can look at the purchase price, because that's going to tell me something about okay, is this a is this a speculative neighborhood? Is this an established neighborhood? You know where where's this neighborhood you know trending? And so when I looked at this zip code and punched it in. I think the average home price in this or median home price in this, this zip code was like 300,000. And so that 230 looks a little different when you think about, okay, potentially this, this neighborhood growing up to a $300,000 value, right? Now, if it had, if I punched it in, it came up at 90,000 and I see I'm spending, you know, 230, I'm like, well, hmm, like the, the, the other houses need to catch up to my house to, to, you know, to sort of justify the value. And I understand that that's, you probably won't read that in any single book, right? No one's probably preaching that on fortune builders or wherever, but that just kind of helps me sort of figure out what type of investment this is. And if, you know, and, and determine whether it's something I want to add to my portfolio. So that's the very first place I go. It's really interesting. I've never heard that before. <laughs> I'm trying to put myself in your shoes and try to see how that's helping me make a decision. If you were to see here that for this home on, on Tulsa, which the price is 230, 230,000 and through Zillow, you saw that the average home in that neighborhood was 210,000. Would you write off this deal? No, I wouldn't. I mean, like, for example, um, I think the, the one that I just purchased in, in 32206, I think the purchase price was 160. Mm -hmm. I think the average neighborhood median home for that zip code was like 100, 110. It's been a while since mm -hmm. I checked it. But, but I was good with it. You know, it was, it was what I was looking for. It was a new build. You know, then I still go through all the line items here on the left-hand side to figure out if it's a fit. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's just sort of my first cut. Is, right? it, is it like you're trying, you're choking, you're, excuse me, you're looking for huge outliers. Is, is that what you're looking for? So no, no, just, 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 yeah, just, just something to give me a, a reference point is really all I'm looking for. It's more Got of just it. a reference point so that I have. I have a point in my head that I can, can, I can evaluate what type of deal this, what type of deal I think this is, is, you know, this purchase would be. Yeah. I, I'm curious, Lewis, since you did, you know, three months of watching the show and a hundred properties before you actually went in, I'm assuming you've done this a bunch of times on yeah. the, on the property of the week. What in general, is there a trend between what you see in the deal eval and when you punch in the zip code for JWB properties in, in Jacksonville? I just know that certain, is there a trend? For example, yeah. some of the, some of the more traditional zip codes like 008, 008, 009. I remember Greg did a show where he was discussing like the top 10 neighborhoods to invest in, in Florida, right. something like that. Yeah. So I went in and I, I wanted to figure out where those zip codes were. Right. So I looked and most of those, most of those neighborhoods were in 08 and 09. Right. And what that told me, like, because I looked at all the home values in those neighborhoods, what that told me is, okay, these neighborhoods are appreciating because invest, I, I this is my assumption. Investors are, are targeting those neighborhoods and that's why there's such high appreciation because they can get in at a low purchase price and that's driving up the values in the neighborhood, right? And so if that's the type of play like you're looking for, you know, or if I'm looking for anybody's looking for, then yeah, I'm, I'm all in, you know, and that's sort of what I saw in O in O six. I sort of see O six as being like a bleed over neighborhood of that same effect, right? It wasn't in those, it wasn't in that top 10, but it was, it was situated as such, like it's just outside of downtown, you know, you all are doing a lot of development downtown that's going to move up, you know, mm -hmm. as, as things start to fill in. And so I feel like, okay, this is a good spot to just kind of post up and wait and, and, and see what happens. Right. So those are the types of things, you know, in terms of trends, those are the types of things that I see, you know, when I, when I do this kind of analysis. So see, man, that, that kind of reminds yeah. me of uh, something you shared on the tour. Well, it is, it is. I had a couple more questions though, before right, we get there. It, so <laughs> <laughs> if you are okay you're with the it, pro. you're okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm super curious. I think this is a great learning lesson because I'm trying to understand what people are, how people make decisions, right? Am I understanding it correctly that you're, you're, you obviously know the team and the market that you're working with, but are you looking for maybe some outsized growth? Like that's some, some upside? No, you're not. Are you looking for like a neighborhood that's on the rise? No. Okay. 
No, well, like you know, to get to the bottom of this. Like, <laughs> it's it's because... <laughs> I, like I said, it's it's a quirk. It's just it's just a quirk. You know, okay. I remember I remember when I first met my first meeting with Mike Stewart uh-huh. when I first started back in beginning of 2020, and I was asking these questions about like zip codes, and he's like, "Why are you talking about zip codes? Like, it doesn't matter. Just just pick just." just just buy something somewhere like they're all the same like you don't you can't you're not gonna you know post up here and then all of a sudden someone's gonna build like a you know like a, a huge mall next to your place and your value's gonna shoot up like don't look for that yeah. just just everything you know kind of you know right. will kind of ride like, like the, the tides will kind of rise and fall you know together mm-hmm. i was like all right mike i'll take that advice but i still need to look at this right? like i still need to look i at love the, the honesty codes. I love the truth. <laughs> and so, you know, it's it's not like I said, it's just really a reference. It's just to help me put it in frame of reference. That's all. Cool. So you're yeah. you're far away. You're across the country and it's just right. it's a it's a it's a data point there. Yeah. Yep. The reason I was asking so much is because, you know, a couple of things. Like when people want to invest in properties, I think it's natural for them to say, Oh, I, I listen, the numbers today look really good, but I want to make sure I'm in the path of progress, right? I want to make sure I'm in, you know, what's up and coming in an area. And, you know, unfortunately, that is a way that most real estate agents really sell a lot of properties because they talk about this and they pitch a good story, but it's really, it's, it's emotional and it's subjective and it's not really based in data. And, you know, therefore we don't really use that, right? Like I don't really go into a property to recommend for a client and say, well, listen, it's because this shopping center is going in next door or because there's a Publix or a bus route or something along those lines because our clients are looking for the buy and hold for a 10 to 20 year cycle. And while those things may happen, I don't want people buying based off of that. I just want it to be the status quo for what it is today. And I know that if you buy in the right growth market, it's going to work and it's going to work really well over a 10 to 20 year cycle. So I always, I always, that's why I was curious if that was leading to that. It's good to know that that's not really a reason why you're investing. Well, the only, the only other thing I was going to mention there is just most people, when they're looking to make sure that the values are what they need to be, you know, you do that through an appraisal. So that happens later on, right? You put the home under contract, you get an appraisal and all of that. So I guess I was wondering there, if that's just like a leading indicator for an appraisal that, you know, you're going to get later on. No. All right. Well, there we go. I, that, that's the, all the, all of my ammo there. <laughs> No, because really, like now, you know, with the two that I have, like I don't even think about them. Like I don't even think about oh, oh, you know, what's going on in the neighborhood, you know, blah blah blah. blah. It was, it was, it was just a way, like I said, for me at the onset to just kind of get familiar with this, with this asset and how it relates to different assets and you know that sort of thing. So, like I said, it's really just a reference point, nothing more than that. What's the right way to think about that, man? I, like I'm. Again, I'm, I'm thinking about the stat that you shared on the tour. I, yeah. I think maybe right now is a good time to talk about it because I, I feel like what he's saying from the outside looking in holds some weight, this idea of where the, where the values are and where the home is, and maybe that is outside gains. But Well, my concern is that it could lead to, in, to unsubstantiated conclusions, Okay. right? You know, Zillow is an aggregator of data, and Zillow is a nice tool for us to have it really is just a data point though. It's not a decision-making tool. And if you really want to know the, the case study in that, go look at what Zillow did. Zillow last year went really big and for, year, for a couple of years went really big into using their own Zillow estimates to actually buy properties. And that was their business model or a portion of their business model to become flippers. And they were using their own data to do it. And in a market that appreciated 20% year over year, Zillow managed to lose $800 million that way. Okay. Uh, you know, that, and so, and then Zillow stopped. It was a huge failure for Zillow. So I think what that reinforces is that Zillow data is a data point, but it's not, it is not good enough right now to use it to make buying decisions. And your best buying decisions come from a trusted partner in your real estate market and using, using that data. So my only concern with that is, is using that data to, to, substantially either reinforce or sway a buying decision. I think it's nice to look at, just like Lewis said, right? It's a, it's a data point. It's something to me, you know, there shouldn't be huge outliers. If your price on your property is 230,000, the median home sales price in that neighborhood shouldn't be 50,000 according to Zillow. So maybe it's an outlier thing. If it's your first time doing this, sure, do that. But, 
I think you need to lean into the team and the partner that you're working with to help you make that decision. And then I think you'll be in the right spot. Tell us about the data that you've reviewed. You really want to know this data. What, what if I hold this data it's, back? It's, 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 time, it's time to share that, man. Like, well, so I'm kind not of, everybody was there on Friday. Yeah. So here's some really cool, cool stuff, guys. We went and we looked at, you know, when JWB sort of what I would call became scalable in our neighborhoods, right? When we had been investing for a certain period of time where we had achieved a certain amount of scale in our neighborhoods. And when JWB as a team was really vertically integrated, that was what I estimated to be 2013, right? I looked at the number of properties we had under management. I know how long we had been doing this. I looked at when we had our own innovation department starting to to spread its wings in terms of figuring out new construction and townhomes and all of these things that we had done. And so 2013 is what I would call the first year of real vertical integration for JWB. And I said, you know what? If I'm trying to talk to somebody about why to put their money with JWB versus another competitor out there, another competitor who goes from market to market to market and has impact in 10 markets, but not 10 times the impact in one market, why should they put their money with JWB? And what it came down to for me is I was like, you know what? I bet the neighborhoods that we have been in from 2013 on, I bet they have grown more than the typical neighborhood in Jacksonville. And if that was the case, then that would be just a clear sign of JWB's impact. And the reason for you to put your money with an insider like JWB, who's going to put you in the right neighborhoods, who also has their own money in all of those neighborhoods, and who does all of these things to make sure that your neighborhoods and your investments are going to grow. So I was like, well, let me go to the data. So we ran all of the properties that our clients purchased since 2013, all the way till now. And I ran it against the typical Jacksonville market. And JWB neighborhoods have appreciated 79% more than the typical neighborhood in Jacksonville since 2013. So if you're wondering why to invest with a vertically integrated company, there is not a better stat than that one to show you how your neighborhoods, your investments are going to grow substantially more when you can work with a vertically integrated provider. <coughs> How'd I do? I thought that was pretty good. Was good? Lewis, how'd that land on you, man? Hey, I mean, that's, you know, the first thought that I had was, like I, like I said before, even though Mike told me, don't look at the zip codes, like I didn't completely dismiss what he was saying. And I think that what Greg just said validates what Mike told me, and and I'm glad that I didn't just completely say, "Hey, Mike, you're crazy. You need to look at the zip codes." Like I, like I never, I've never divorced myself from that concept. Like I just sort of, you know, I sort of, I I trust that, you know, you all the experts, you all know, you all know it a lot better than I do. You know Jacksonville a lot better than I do. So I'll, I'll trust that as just kind of a given. But I, but I still need to do my own little investigation here that. on the side. <laughs> I think there's a, there's a happy medium there, right? You know, the key is that we are in these neighborhoods ourselves, right? We own over 300 rental properties exactly in these same neighborhoods. So we have this incentive to make them, to make them grow. And we want, we want folks to understand why we're in those neighborhoods. And then once we're in those neighborhoods, there's only four of them, right? We, we can walk through why we choose these neighborhoods. Then between those four neighborhoods, it really doesn't matter the assets, right? They are the same demographics, the same return potential, the same management, the same residents, the same contractors or builders are building the homes. So we look at those as just plug and play once you're in that bubble of our neighborhoods. And actually one, one point I just wanted to add to that, Greg, is when I did that initial due diligence of looking at a hundred properties, what I found was the property started to look the same no matter where they were. Mm -hmm. And that just, I think that just kind of, you know, emphasizes the point that you're just making. So it really doesn't matter so much where, where you pick within these neighborhoods because the properties are going to look the same. They're going to have similar, you know, floor plans, layouts, that sort of thing. And, and so that kind of gave me more, more confidence in terms of what Mike was saying when, when I, when I first met with him that, you know, that it really doesn't matter. And then also it, it gave me confidence in terms of like, going into the future. Like I didn't want to sit there and sort of wait for, oh, this specific property to come up, you know, that looks like this and, 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 and is near that and whatnot. Like just, just pick one, get in, sit and, and hold on to it, you know? So. I love it. I love it.
Exactly right. Yeah, love it. That reminds me of what Brandon tells me. It's like, just get in the game, right? Like, get, a, get, a, get on base. Get on base <laughs> right? yeah. You're going to get home. All yeah. right, we got a couple of questions here from the audience. We got Lee Bishop, MVP of the community, asking, the credit is just for the rent gap? Question mark. Is there money set aside to bring it up to JWB standards as well? Roof may be in question from the picture. That is just for the rent gap. The property is up to the JWB standard. Before I would bring a property to you or we would bring a property to any of our clients, we always ensure that the property is up to the JWB standard. As you have seen, and Lee has seen this in other properties of the week, sometimes that buyer credit, and this is rare as well, but sometimes that buyer credit might have a maintenance credit. Or, or it may have a rent credit, or it could technically have both. That maintenance credit would be if when we inspected that home and it wasn't up to the JWB standard, if there was a roof issue for, for in this example, then we would set aside that money as a credit for you when you purchase, but, but not this one. Well, that kind of, I guess, answer Murph Hayes' question that asks, built in 1961, how old is the roof? I don't know the question, or I don't know the answer to that one, Murph. I didn't look it up ahead of time, but I do know somebody who do know, who does know that answer is my JWB team. So just reach out to us. We'd be happy to get that information for you. Awesome. And Leo Faraganan. All right. Not really good with taxes, but is this 6K taxable, the buyer credit? On the side, not getting to know the air. Oh, sorry. So that's the question. Okay. Yes and no. When we talk about the five profit centers, we talk, and you remember the five profit centers? Probably? I do remember the five you, profit what centers. Are, what are the five profit? Let's see if Lewis knows the five profit centers too. Let's go rapid fire here. Follow Let's go, you Lu first. Lewis is the guest expert. Let's okay. Go Lewis first. Oh gosh. You're putting me on the spot. Um, well, appreciation, principal pay down, tax savings. I know inflation hedging is one. Yeah. Now I'm missing one. Depreciation. Cash flow, cash flow man. Oh, did I say? No. You didn't. <laughs> oh, depreciation is part of tax. Right, right. Depreciation. Yeah, 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 yeah. You got it. That's, fun, that, that's awesome. That's funny how you, that was the last thing that you thought of. That's growth for our community <laughs> yeah, right yeah, there, right? Yeah, yeah. When we started this show, the only thing anybody ever talked about was cash flow. So the fact that you know the five profit centers and you said cash flow last is real growth for us. Well, All it's right, funny because so, it's it, it's kind of in line with my strategy because, you know, as, you, I, as uh, you'll see, I've only purchased with non-recourse financing using my mm -hmm. retirement account. And so really the cash flow doesn't even like cross my mind. That makes sense. I never, I never see it, you know, so. That makes sense. <laughs> So of those five profit centers, tax savings is one of those profit centers. Now, here's what tax savings does, right? When you earn rental income for your rental property, that is taxable. That means that it's taxable at your federal income tax bracket. So if you're in the 25% tax bracket and you earn, you know, $3,000 for the year in rental income, then you'd pay that percentage on that $3,000 and, and that would be taxes that you would have to pay unless you have this amazing thing called depreciation. And depreciation is a write-off. Whether your house breaks or not during that year, the IRS just says, I'm giving you this write-off. And so in this case, Leo, for the, for the credit of $6,960, right, that is taxable, but your write-off may cover all of that or some of that. And then get this, if you have other properties in addition to this one, like for example, Lewis has another JWB property. If he has unused depreciation on that other property, that can offset the full amount of this property. So it's as long as they are like-kind assets and in real estate, and I'm sure there's other legal and accounting mumbo jumbo to take into account there. But the, the key here is that's the beauty of tax savings. It is income that you earn but you have built-in tax advantages that keep that money there rather than you having to pay taxes on it, which you would in almost every other asset class if you earn that same amount of money. All right, that was clear enough. And then Leo also ended that with, on the side note, getting to know the area, including zip code, is additional resources for me to explore all options. But end of the day, I still analyze the property with the five profit centers that you guys are discussing every week. Gosh, this is a good, this is a good show. Put a smile this on is, my this face. Show, this show makes me happy. <laughs> All right, Lewis, are you ready to dive into the work that GC put in to uh, showcase your investor journey? I've been, I was, I've been ready for this. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> you're here for it. All right, man. Lewis, I, I got to ask you, you know, you're an incredibly successful patent attorney. You've been doing real estate for 20 years. You were humble enough to go and seek training to do this on, on, a, on a grander scale or at least outside of your, your neighborhood. 
I don't feel like that. I mean, when I think patent attorney, I think conservative. I think risk averse, right? <laughs> but knowing your, your path for the last 20 years, it doesn't seem like that lines up. Where does that come from? What, what got you into real estate and what got you into being a patent attorney? Cause they don't think seem to jive for me. Wow. Wow. That's, those are two loaded questions. Uh, so patent attorney, <laughs> patent attorney was really just real simply. I was an engineer as an undergrad. I didn't want to, when I was graduating from college, I didn't want to go out and work first. I still wanted to stay in school and get another degree. Knew I didn't want to be a doctor. I knew business school required you to leave and, you know, then come back to school. And I didn't want to do that. And so law school was kind of the only option to kind of stay in school. I wasn't, I didn't want to get a master's in engineering. I had enough, you know, engineering at the time. And so law school just seemed, you know, to be appealing. My, my dad went to law school. And so I just kind of did it. I also, I did some due diligence and I looked up the, uh, you know, starting salaries for, for attorneys. And I was like, okay, this, this might be a good path. So let me, let me do that. <laughs> We're all right with that. And then when I got into it, you know, the combination of, of an engineering degree and a law degree just kind of led to being a patent attorney and my best opportunities came, you know, in the, in the patent space. So that's kind of how that happened. But real estate, you know, honestly, I, I really have to attribute it to a, a, a friend of mine from back home in Buffalo. Cause he, you know, he's kind of a, he was kind of a guy who just kind of always had like a hustle going on. Right. Yeah. You know, he's just, just always had a hustle. And he started telling me about how he was buying, you know, properties in Buffalo, which is where we grew up for like 10 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand. I was like, get out of here. You're, you're silly. Like you're, I don't even want to hear it. Like stop talking right. to me. Yep. But when, and, and then he was doing like these cash out refis and, you know, telling me how much money he was making. I was like, you're, 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 you're ridiculous. <laughs> but then I actually started like investigating as like, okay, he's kind of on to something. And so that's, I, I really have to, to sort of give credit to him. Cause he kind of, he was kind of the one that planted the seed in my head to, to actually investigate it. And then by some stroke of luck, I ended up reading, you know, rich dad, poor dad uh, around the same time. And then when I read that, I think that sort of cemented it just kind of that, that change in perspective that that book gives you. So I think that's kind of where, where it started. Man, I can relate so well to all of those things, right? You know, I know that I, without my business partner, Alex, who is that guy who, who he always had a hustle going on in college and in high school when we were friends and in college, and he always saw things differently. And I know that he pushed me. And I'd like to think that I still would have taken that risk to, to, to start JWB but without him. It wouldn't have happened. So I can definitely relate to that. You know what I hear in that story with that I think is interesting is that he was an engineer first. Yeah, that was the other thing. There's a there's a high number of engineers because you look at these numbers. Like if you know numbers, this is hard to argue for, yep. or argue against, right? Yep, absolutely. Interesting. Well, let's talk a little bit about numbers because as I looked at your your buying plan here, I loved everything about it. You know, talking about why you're investing, right, and then breaking down that goal of your investments and your why into the number of income, the amount of income that you need to earn, and then breaking that down into a number of rental properties to accomplish that. And then laying out where you are today in terms of the number of assets you have and, and your target for getting to that ideal portfolio. Something that most people just never do. Knowing now that you're an engineer and you like planning things out and numbers and all that, can you talk to people about that buying plan, that process? Has it been very helpful for you? Yeah, you know, absolutely. I, and I think like I sort of see my real estate experience in kind of two sort of two halves. There's kind of the pre fortune builders half and kind of the post fortune builders half. And, and it was kind of in the post fortune build, like I sort of realized when I got into the post fortune builders half that what everything I was doing pre fortune builders, I was just kind of didn't know what I was doing. You know, I didn't have a plan. It really, right. there was really no direction and that sort of thing. And, you know, it, it led to a lot of, you know, you know, you know, missteps here and there, but once you, once I got into fortune builder and started, you know, thinking about this from a, from a planning perspective, from a long range perspective, that's kind of where I started putting down these sort of, you know, milestones, so to speak, and, and kind of thinking about things long-term. And, you know, one of the things that I see here, like the, the very first, the first, first thing I see on this line here is in terms of the why, like kind of the, the rationale behind the why, I mean, that's, that is the why that's listed there, but the, kind of the rationale behind it, the way I think about it is I think of my life as sort of like when I'm going to hit these sort of major financial milestones, right? Like when, when am I going to retire? When are my kids going to college? 
when do when are we going to buy you know a, a, a primary residence and i sort of you know line those up with the age i'm going to be at those times and then i need to figure out okay well how am i going to do that you know <laughs> like my, you know my yeah. i mean my my son's 11 he's going to college in seven years he's got yeah seven years i mean that to me that seems like it's a long time but it's also a very short time right, right. and so you sort of have to like think about that that hit that's going to hit if he wants to go to the schools that I went to, like, you know, there needs to be money <laughs> to, to pay for that, right? And so that's, I just kind of work backwards, you know, from that perspective. I sort of see it as like, one of the things that I always come back to is I think about is building the bridge backwards, right? Like, like starting with the, the post that's all the way out there and building it back to present day, rather than trying to like build it, you know, front from, from this step, from where I am right now forward, I sort of see it, okay, I need that post there, build it back to towards where I am sitting right now. What, what a simple concept, but also a, a transformational concept, right? What if, what if our communities and our world thought that way? And yeah. we thought through the exit or the end and how we were going to get there. I mean, man, that, that is such a thing that is in business and in, in just about anything, right? Like start with the end in mind is, right. is, is so underrated. But you never do it in rental properties. People never do that. It's like they know that's the right thing to do. And it's hard to find people who are disciplined enough to do that outside of rental properties. But then in rental properties, because it's it's a little bit more murky. If there's five profit centers rather than just one. And, you know, cash flows, you know, sometimes they are a little bit more than you expect. And sometimes they're a little bit less than you expect. And so people are like, well, listen, I can't, I can't possibly build a plan there. You know, but you can you can have a plan. It's something that our team does with every new client we come on board. And then we know just like Lewis, okay, well, are we paying for college in seven years? Well, let's make sure that we build this portfolio the right way. Are we retiring in 15 years or in 20 years or in five years? We need to build this portfolio the right way because that can affect the decision to use cash or something we're going to talk about here in just a second of non-recourse financing or conventional financing. So I just applaud you, my friend. I, I think this is just wonderful. Thank you. Right, Thank next, you. Next slide. Well, so at the bottom there is, is, I'm sure everybody is looking there. There is Lewis's first property with us. The second one hasn't hit the reporting yet because he just closed, but we have this one here. It's on Cheryl Ann. And, uh, and this is one that you bought with that non-recourse financing. Many people have no clue what non-recourse financing is. Can you tell people what that is and why you use it on this home? Sure. So non-recourse financing, it's the name for the financing that you can get when you purchase a property using your retirement account. And uh, I guess the non-recourse means that the only recourse, it's non-recourse as to you, right? <laughs> the only right. recourse that the lender has is to your retirement account and the assets in your retirement account. So, so that's what non-recourse financing is. The reason I, I, I went down this path for the first purchase and actually the second purchase is because at the same time we've been saving to buy our primary residence here in California. You know, when we moved here eight years ago, we, we owned a place in New York. We sold that we've been renting since we've been in California. And so I sort of see like our, you know, available cash as being in two, in two buckets, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's the bucket that gets taxed and there's a bucket that doesn't get taxed mm -hmm. or that gets that, that's tax advantage, I guess I should say, right? Right. And I wanted to max out that tax advantage bucket, right? So, <clears throat> so I try to max out my retirement, you know, contributions every year. And, you know, and I wanted to, you know, I, I don't really like, I mean, well, I should say that. I felt like that was going to be the, 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 the quickest path for me to buy a property, buy rental properties, while also save you know, for Makes our sense. primary residence, because you can't use, you know, tax advantage dollars to buy a primary residence, right? So I wanted to keep both trains moving. And, and that's why I, you know, I went with the uh, non-recourse financing retirement account purchase for, for these first two. Exactly. So for anybody out there who is saying, I'd like to start to build my rental property portfolio, but I don't have my, I don't have capital sitting on the sideline. You may, you may be just like Lewis who had capital in his retirement accounts and then was able to use financing in his retirement accounts to start building his rental property portfolio, to start getting on that plan that he laid out. And now he's going to be years and years in advance because he was able to unlock that capital. So a great learning lesson for everybody. And congratulations on number two. That's exciting. When's, uh, so is this, is this an annual plan for you or what's, what's the, what's the 
regular rotation of new acquisitions for you in your mind? Minimum one per year. Mm -hmm. Minimum one per year. Since I've got this one in the first half of, of the second one in the first half of 22, I hope I can squeeze out one in the second half. We'll see. But yeah, minimum, when I, when I went into this plan, it was minimum one per year. I'm curious about that because within a retirement account, it's hard to get more money into that. There's limitations to be able to do that. What, how do you determine your interval of buying if, if it's somewhat limited as far as the capital that you have in your retirement account? Yeah. So I think the short answer to your question is at some point I'm going to exhaust what I have available to me in my retirement account and I'll start using, you know, conventional financing to get additional properties. But as long as I can keep, you know, acquiring properties through the retirement account without impacting the savings for the primary residence, I plan to do that. But like I said, you know, at some point that's going to run out and I'll need to start using, you know, a more conventional option. So that's Makes kind sense. of the, the, the rough plan right now. I don't, I don't expect to, to do all, you know, what, 14 here through the right. retirement account. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, unless, unless I can figure out, you know, the, the Hervé Francois strategy of just, you know, birthing new properties out of your retirement account, like, <laughs> you know, uh, I think we're all I, trying I to, to figure out. Yeah. I need well, to I get on that plan. Figure out how to be more like Hervé. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It starts yeah. with, it starts with not pronouncing the H yeah, every, yeah. every time you speak. Yeah. Add out. There you all go. Right. I like it. I like it. <laughs> all right, cool. Next pick? Yeah, next page. So, next page. all right, this is what, I mean, can we just talk about this for the next hour or so? I was so fired up to see it's not just you as a Steeler fan, it's your entire family. And I want you to know, I think I have these exact same pictures with my kids and my family. So, it's awesome, brother. Well, I, I got I to gotta clarify. So, the picture on the on the left there with the, with the big symbol, that's at Latrobe. We went to training uh -huh. camp. Uh -huh. And my, my, my wife's from Philadelphia, so she's diehard Eagles fan. You can see she's not wearing any Steelers uh, paraphernalia. <laughs> and, and my daughter, at, at this point, was still young enough that I, actually, I could actually get her to, to wear Steelers uh, yeah. gear. But now she's an Eagles fan like like my wife. So they're they're one side of the house and my son and I are the other side. <laughs> oh, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. I, I, uh, I might be seeing a similar fate in my house as my kids grow up as well. I have a nine and a seven-year-old, so we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Let's keep them away from Dolphins fan. Right <laughs> oh, man. All right. So as we do, we always look at the highest lifetime return. Uh, this is not including home price appreciation yet. We'll do that at the end. And we always uh, show the lowest lifetime return. We get to save some time here because it's the same property. It's the only one in, in, uh, in Lewis's report here. So it's this one on Cheryl Land. And, you know, we've got about a 2% return. Many people would look at that and be like, oh, geez, it's only 2%. But the interesting thing is when you buy a non-recourse property, when you buy a property with that type of financing, you're not doing it for cash flow. The expectation for his return for just the cash flows on this is actually just under 1.9%. It's 1.8%. So we're actually overperforming. And so you might say, well, why would somebody buy a property like this in order to, um, you know, accepting a low return on investment, you know, in terms of the cash flows? Well, that's because there's only, that's only one of the profit centers, right? There's five profit centers. And that's why we're going to take a look here at the total for five profit centers right after this, Vanna. <laughs> so Lewis, this is, uh, this is where you stand after a year of ownership, only a year of ownership. And I think it's really important to understand the context of the last year. Pablo, what's the stock market done in the last six months? Uh, taking like a 20% haircut? Lost 20%. For most retirement accounts, are they largely invested in stocks and bonds and mutual funds? Largely, yes. Yes. So if Lewis hadn't made that decision to move his money from the stock market, I'm assuming it was in, to rental properties. We're not just talking about the gains that we're talking about here. It's all of the money that he saved and preserved that he didn't lose in the other asset classes. So keep that in mind. Just a great decision for you. But Lewis, we're looking at five profit centers here. For your net rental income, you've actually been positive. I know, you know, the way that this, the decision is made here is it's about break even when you're buying non-recourse property. So some positive cash flow is certainly a win there. And that's certainly nice. Tax savings, you don't actually get any additional tax savings when you buy in a retirement account. Pablo, do you know why that is? Because you've already deferred the taxes. Exactly. You already get the tax savings. As Lewis was talking about his tax advantaged bucket, that's his retirement account bucket. So just because of the structure of his retirement account, he already gets tax deferral. 
in place. So you don't get additional tax savings from a rental property. So it's a zero there, but just know that he already gets that. Principal pay down. It's really nice to know that our residents are paying our loans down for you. We always want somebody to just swoop in and pay off all of our loans, right? Well, that's that's called rental property investing. So we have just uh, under $2,000 of principal being paid down already just in one year for Lewis and for his family. And then this has just been a great year to be able to buy a property. One year ago till today, we, we talked about it a lot that, you know, home price appreciation has been at an all-time high for a one-year rate. The thing that I like to make sure everybody knows is we need to congratulate Lewis for making a great decision. And you've earned $30,000 in home price appreciation. But what many people fail to realize is they think that this only makes sense and that appreciation is only such a big component over the last year. When actually, if you look over a 10 or a 20 year cycle of holding onto this property, home price appreciation would still actually be the largest driver of, of his returns on investment. So don't, don't fall in love with this incredibly high appreciation rate, Lewis. It's not going to be this, but we all need to look at all five profit centers when making a decision. And if you look at what historically accurate home price appreciation rates are, you're still going to see this as the biggest component of your return on investment. And if we're talking about the Hervé own buying plan, right? Like, <laughs> these are, these are $160,000 property that he's got $30,000 worth of appreciation. If that happens for a couple more years, he's able to take that appreciate, take that equity out and pay for the next own. Exactly. We talked about how nice it is to have a buyer credit to start out in advance and setting yourself up for success. Well, you and Lewis and everybody else who has bought, especially in, in prior years, right? You're starting out with this huge advantage. It's setting yourself up for success in terms of your return on investment, maybe even refinancing, maybe even pulling capital out and maybe using that towards other rental properties or private lending. Um, and so when we talked about a year ago or two years ago, these are some of the things that are now possible because of those good decisions. Awesome. So here's how it stacks up. The expected return on investment for Lewis's property that he purchased one year ago was 1.8%, right? We didn't bank on any home price appreciation at that time, right? It was just gravy. Well, that gravy's really turned into over an 11% actual return on investment. This includes all of the costs that it would take to actually sell the investment as well. So 11% when you were expecting 2%. Lewis, how are you feeling over there? I'm feeling great. I'm feeling great. This is the first time I've seen this. So, uh, no, that's, that's great. <laughs> it's incredible. It's a, it's a testament to you, to the, doing the due diligence, to investing with the right team, right? With the JWB team and also with the fortune builders team and, and learning from those who had been at a level of success in just in this realm in your life, but just rental prices, working with those who had achieved a level of success that you haven't yet. And there's beauty in that. And because of that, you just made some really great decisions and I'm excited to bring you back on the show and get to take a look at the second property and how your overall portfolio continues to perform as you get closer and closer to 14 properties with us. Sounds good to me. Want to talk about this last little pie here? You know, I think we, we hit this already, but I always like to show the total percentage of returns by the profit center, right? Cash flow is important. It is important to look at, but it's not the end all be all. Many people only look at cash flow. And what we try to share with folks on the, on the show here is that it's important to, to look at it but it's like your entry into the dance. It is, it is the standard. You need to be positive cash flow. After that point, your other profit centers are actually going to make up the majority of your total return on investment. And that's what you see here, right? Even if we didn't have 20% home price appreciation, this graph would still largely be slanted towards home price appreciation being the biggest driver of returns. And that's not saying we're going to fall in love with home price appreciation, but it just says we're going to look at all five profit centers. Love it. Love it. Lewis, what do you think, man? Overall? I mean, overall, you know, I mean, I, I, my, my eyes go right to that home price appreciation number because that's what I wanted. You know, when I, when I sat down with the Passive Income Club, you know, four years ago, I said, that's what I want. I want that high appreciation, no snow. And, and that's what I got. So, uh, so we I'm happy that. about that. Yeah. I think that's a new tagline for JWB. <laughs> Invest with us. High appreciation. No snow. I'm in, man. I'm in. Vertically integrated, high appreciation, no snow. Right? <laughs> Don't complicate it. <laughs> it's, it's typical, typical bad marketing guy over here. Uh, Lewis, man, this was awesome. I, I really, you know, we haven't had a lot of people that have one property on. We haven't had like your, your scenario of having been in the game for 20 years, but really just 
being out and then in and then getting back in one year ago, that data point of watching the show for three months before making a decision really floats my boat personally. And just the idea of the um, being in the non-recourse and the non-recourse bucket, man, I thought that this was really, really informative for me. I know that it was really informative for our, for our community. We had 30 plus folks that were with us in the middle of a Thursday on a work day. That's a testament to you and the value that you bring and, and bringing your friends on the show and, and getting to see some new people and, and talking to you, man, was really, really awesome. Thanks for correcting me on your hometown. I want to, I want to thank everybody that was with us today. I want to thank the, the JWB team who's with us. All They're right, like, team. Thank you and, all for being here. For providing the audience participation. Really awesome. This Tuesday, we're going back to our not your average investment takes. What is it? Not your average investment insights Love where it. we're just going to tease. We, we, we found some insights into the stocks that perform the best during inflationary times and uh spoiler alert it's not REITs no <laughs> so it's not. so we're gonna we're gonna talk about some some particular insights and a couple of other things so this was really awesome GC I'm gonna give you here last words and then kick it over to Lewis to send us away yeah I just I uh, super appreciate our team being here this is something that is new for us to bring the team in you guys there you go you guys are on camera right now so we just invited a few members of our team to come in and just kind of help help this become more of a real thing. And, you know, the team has reached out and wanted to be a part of the special community that we have. So thank you all for being here. Lewis, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your story. There's so much good stuff here to learn. And I really appreciated a slightly different perspective on a few different things as well. And, uh, you know, last but not least go Steelers. I hope you're ready for a good season this season. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> and thank you all to the community. I, I'm excited for more of these stories, just like Lewis's to share. So if anybody would like to be in Lewis's seat and would like to be on the property of the week and to share their story, we have a couple of openings. I think towards the end of July, we have a couple of openings. So please reach out to Madison, either in the chat now, or um, you can send an email to is it Madison at JWB companies, right? Madison with two D's, right? Madison with two D's at jwbcompanies.com and you can be the next guest investor. Lewis, before we get out of here, man, you, you've been in the game for 20 years, right? Like you are, you're obviously a smart guy. You're an engineer, you're an attorney. What, what, what is your biggest, what would you advise to folks that are thinking about getting into real estate? Yeah, I think the thing that I think about the most is, and I, it took me a while to sort of figure this out, but you have to figure out the way to play real estate, the way that sort of fits your life, you know? As I mentioned, I think, I don't know if this was early on or when we spoke before the call, but I mean, I'm busy. Like I got emails flying off right now. I've got clients looking for me right now. Like I can't be out, you know, picking up hammers and, and doing rehabs. Like I just don't have the time for that. And so it, it took me a while to kind of get out of this hustler mentality, which I kind of started my real estate with career with to, you know, putting my, putting my trust in, in other people and just kind of, you know, letting my, my money sort of work for me. I mean, I knew you could do that, but I hadn't really found the right situation. And certainly thinking about doing it in a city that I've never been to 3000 miles away, you know, never, never hit my, hit me until, you know, four years ago. And so now I just feel like this, this is the, this play, the way I'm playing it right now fits sort of the station of life that I'm in. And, and I just kind of want to sort of maximize that now that I've kind of found like a nice little groove, groove that I'm in. So just keep stacking, just keep stacking those houses. <laughs> love that, man. I love that. Thank you so much for that. And if you want high appreciation, no snow and have real estate fit into your life, you just can't be an average investor. See you next week. See you everybody.